Now that you've learned what exactly GMOs are and why we use them in agriculture, let's talk about their impacts. Now, before we can really explore the impacts, we kind of need to talk about their history first because it'll then paint their impacts in a better light, or at least a more educated light. So the very first part of the GMO history timeline is just the very first one. So the very first time scientists were able to successfully transfer DNA from one organism to another was actually back in the early 70s. So 1973, we were able to take bacteria with DNA from, sorry, we were able to take DNA from one bacteria and insert it into another bacteria. End of story. Now this in and of itself wasn't like, oh my God, the technology for bacteria. No, but it proved proof of concept. We were able to do this and the question was how can we expand this for good? So one of the very first I guess positive technologies that came out of GMOs was looking at insulin. So in 1978 about five years later scientists were successfully able to take the insulin gene from humans. So kind of as a backtrack insulin is a chemical that our body creates and what insulin does is it tells our cells to take sugar out of our blood. So when you eat stuff, that's going to raise your blood sugar. But the sugar needs to go somewhere and needs to go into your cells. Your cells need to use it. So your body creates insulin as you're eating. That's essentially saying like, hey, skin cells, hey, liver cells, hey, heart cells. You know, as you see sugar in the bloodstream, be sure to take it out. So insulin kind of helps cells to take in blood sugar. Now you might be like, oh, insulin, isn't that what diabetics need? So yes, T particularly type one diabetes are people who just can't make insulin. There is something wrong in their genetic code preventing them from making insulin. So when they eat or really to control their blood sugar, they have to inject themselves with insulin so that again, they can tell their cells, hey, can you take that sugar out of my body, please? So, Maybe you never thought of this, but like, where does that insulin come from? Like you might donate blood, but you're not like, oh, can you also, I'd like to donate insulin. That is not how that conversation works. So what scientists were able to do was take that gene, take that DNA, take those instructions from human cells that say, here's how you make insulin. And we were able to inject it into bacteria and the bacteria, because our DNA is all the same, Bacteria is able to read it. Bacteria is like, ah, this is a new combination of A's and T's and G's and C's, but eh, that's fine. I know how to read it. Bacteria make insulin. And then we kind of kill all the bacteria. We isolate the insulin. And that's what people are getting injections of. They're injecting themselves with human insulin that bacteria made, but it's still the same insulin. So this was kind of one of the very first groundbreaking impacts of this GMO technology. All right, so let's go ahead and bring it back to agriculture. So we didn't start experimenting with it with food for quite a while. So 1994, some of you may be alive at this point. Some of you might have been born a little bit after this. So 1994, the first GMO food is released onto the market. You could buy this in grocery stores. And in case you're curious, the very first GMO food was flavor saver tomatoes. Fun fact about these. So the point of this type of tomato was to have a longer shelf life. And it kind of did like you would pick up that tomato and after a week, it still felt nice and plump, the skin nice and red. But when you cut into it, it may have already been rotten on the inside. So it was early on, our GMO is much better now. We understand the technology better. But the reason I mention this year, this 1994 when they first came out, is directly tied to our next slide about downsides. And so one of the, I guess, issues of evaluating the downsides of GMOs, at least when it comes to human health, is it's still new. Like some of y'all, you're like, or some of you guys, your whole life, you've been eating GMOs. If you ever ate baby food, you were eating GMOs. You've been eating it your whole life, but old, older people like myself, you know, we lived in a time where there weren't GMOs. I don't know how GMOs will impact me 30 years from now because they're so recent. Like 
GMOs are less than 30 years old. So we're going to talk more about this here soon. There's not a lot of evidence that support there's any human impact. Um, actually, there's been no studies that have conclusively said, yes, GMOs are harmful. Are they harmful in 50 years? Are they harmful in 75 years? Well, we don't know because we literally haven't been out that long, but likely not. And this should make sense to you because think about it. Um, a lot of our crops, for example, we have GMO corn that has DNA from potatoes. Potatoes grow in colder areas. And so we gave that gene to corn so that it would survive in colder areas. Cool. Well, you eat potatoes and you eat corn. So using the DNA from one to the other shouldn't make an impact. Also, the, the corn is, I guess, developing a feature that already exists in something we're consuming. So the fact that it hasn't really impacted human health should not be surprising to you. I will say, this is kind of as an aside, when we were first making GMOs, we weren't thinking about allergies. So there may or may not have been shellfish DNA introduced to other foods and it like triggered allergies in people. But we're like, ah, oh, we should not use peanut DNA in other foods because a lot of people are allergic to peanuts. So I, I do want to make that aside, but no one's actually gotten sick. Like, oh my God, I've got GMO poisoning or oh my God, like... I'm going to get cancer in 50 years because of GMOs. Like that, that kind of research like doesn't exist. And in my opinion, it probably never will because it's, we're not haphazardly creating DNA. It's not like, we're like, you know what? Let's just put, let's smack an A, a T and a G in there. Let's just see what happens. It's not like that. What's happening is we're like, here's DNA and things that already exist in nature. Sometimes things we already consume Let's put it in this other plant. So while no, we don't know what it's going to be like in 50, 60, 70 years, we have a pretty good idea that it's not going to impact human health. But just because it's not going to impact human health doesn't mean there's not downsides. So most of the downsides related to GMOs are related to the GMOs that have something to do with pesticides. So for example, what we might start seeing is super, I shouldn't say might, we're already seeing this. So when we talked about pesticides, one of the things that we talked about is that when you use a pesticide, most of them do not have 100% kill rate. You're going to kill 99.9% .9 of the weeds, 99.9% .9 of the caterpillars. And the 0.1% you didn't kill, well, those were the ones that their immune system, their ability to fight that pesticide was strong and it didn't die. <laughs> well, it didn't die, and guess who's reproducing? Guess who's passing those genes down? Now, that was an issue with pesticides, but remember, some of our GMOs, we've engineered them to make their own pesticides. And so, whether we sprayed a pesticide, or whether we developed a GMO that has its own pesticide, we still have the same issue of making super pests. Related to this, particularly when it comes to plants and thinking about weeds, is that that DNA, that GMO DNA, that pollen, which is a reproductive material of plants, spreads to other crops. Now, the USDA, if you remember from that talk earlier, the USDA does try to test this really hard to make sure that the pollen of a GMO crop isn't passing on to a weed, because otherwise we'd have some problems. But it does happen because nothing is 100% foolproof. And then finally, again, thinking about these pesticides that are built in, it can impact our pollinators. It can impact the good things we want there. That corn kills caterpillars, including, say, the monarch caterpillar. I'm making something up, but just the point being things that we may not be wanting to kill, similar to using pesticides, we might be inadvertently killing. I also mentioned this earlier when talking about Roundup Ready crops, we actually use more pesticides for some of our GMOs because they don't die when we use that pesticide. So we use more of it. So again, when it comes to GMOs, the only honest and real impact that we've measured so far is just environmental impacts. And it's not really from the GMOs that have more nutrition. 
It's not really from the GMOs that can withstand drought. It's from the GMOs that make their own pesticides or GMOs that can resist pesticides, resulting in farmers using more. But let's talk about it. Maybe you're like, you know what? I'm kind of concerned about that. Like, it's cool that humans aren't being impacted, but like, we like the environment. So, so let's talk about kind of what's happening around the world. So there are some countries that have straight up just banned GMOs. It's only three. Those are the ones in red on this map. But quite a few countries, about 61 countries, have labeling laws. So consumers can make a decision about whether or not they want to support GMOs. And I use that word support because, again, there has been no evidence, and there likely never will be, any evidence that GMOs will cause you to get sick, will cause negative health impacts. But if you get to choose between GMO corn and non-GMO corn, you might decide to go with non-GMO corn because you know that its threat to the environment is probably less. Now, you might notice that a lot of Europe has these GMO laws. That's really not surprising. A lot of countries around the world do. What's also interesting is, so Europe, which is usually the country that's like, oh my God, like we want to make sure everyone's safe and we want to make sure everything is like not going to hurt you. They allow GMOs. They just want it to be labeled. Interestingly, in many European countries, you cannot grow GMOs. So farmers cannot grow genetically modified organisms because of the impact to the environment. So we can learn a little bit from these other countries. I do want to share with you this graph. So we're going to take a moment to kind of digest it. On the x-axis is year. On the y-axis is number of G GM or genetically modified crops. And what these lines are representing is how many genetically modified crops have been approved for us to eat. In red, we're looking at the United States, and in blue, we're looking at the EU or the European Union. Remember, the European Union is a lot more strict with their um, health, with their chemicals, with, with everything. Their whole job in the European Union is to protect the consumer. So you can take a couple things away from this. So one, the United States, like, We've approved a lot, and it's, it's only increasing. But here's the thing. The U European Union is approving them, is approving more every day. It's not as quickly as the United States, but they're still approving them. And the fact that they're approving them is telling us, hey, even they're saying it's okay, but it's taking them longer. You may have noticed there's four symbols on this graph. Each symbol is representing a particular GM crop. So for example, this star is Roundup Ready Canola. It was approved in the United States in 19, no, in 1996. It was approved in the EU 1998. Let's look at BT11 corn, approved in the US 1997, approved in the EU 2005. So there's a gap, but they're still being approved. So this hopefully grants you more confidence that you're eating something that is safe for you. For the environment, eh, it'd be cool if you made different choices, but it's a choice that you have. Now, while this map doesn't show the United States in green, if you give it like one more year, it will. So things are happening here in the U.S., so Congress passed a GMO labeling law a few years ago, and President Obama signed it into law in 2016. Now you might be like, that was a long time ago. And it was, and it takes a while <laughs> for things to happen. So after Obama signed it into law, we needed to give the USDA time to create the rules. Essentially the law just said, we will have labeling of GMOs in the United States and nothing else. There was no other information of how that was going to happen. So what the USDA needed to do was take this time, take a couple years to figure out, okay, who needs to label? What exactly needs to be labeled? What does that label look like? What does it need to say? Um, when do they have to have it labeled by? So they had like this whole thing of how they were going to accomplish this. Now you might be like, okay, that's cool, but like I still don't see anything. 
Well, they made these rules in 2018, but then the USDA gave uh, four years to companies, or I guess technically, why not do that? three years to companies to comply with those rules. So December 2018, USDA is like, hey, Kraft, on your mac and cheese boxes, you're going to need to have a label. You have been giving you three years to start thinking about this, to start planning for this, but you're going to need to address this in three years. Now, companies have already had these rules. And if you look closely, you might even see some companies that have already started putting it on their materials. But they don't have to be labeled until January 2022. Now, has the pandemic affected this? I'm not sure. So if you are watching this video in 2022 and you're like, this isn't on my food, it's possible they were delayed. But the law says January 2022. But here's the thing. There's some interesting things that have been in this bill. So you may have noticed the symbols on here. Don't say GMO. They say bioengineered. They say derived from bioengineering. All of the GMO labeling laws actually do not include GMO at all. Interesting. Also, companies can use a lot of different ways to share this information. They can use text, meaning they could just literally write on the, the box, derived from bioengineering. BE product. They could put a symbol. Here are the symbols that have been approved for use. They could use an electronic link, so www.craft.com slash info. They could use a digital link like a QR code. They could put a phone number on their box that says, hey, if you text info to this number, we'll send you information. And I'm going to kind of just, I'm just going to pause there. I don't know about you guys, but I had a lot of feelings towards this information. Feelings we are going to explore more, but I just wanted to give you kind of the facts of what's going to be happening. And I want you to think about how do you feel about this symbol? How do you feel about using bioengineering or BE instead of GMO? Why do you think we allow for these different things? Why do you think we're sticking away from GMO? And we'll definitely be exploring that more. So again, I really, really, really want to emphasize there have been no evidence, no cases of any kind of negative health impact due to GMOs. I personally am not surprised by that because we're using something that is already happening. We are not inventing our own DNA sequences. We likely won't see anything in the long term, but we need to be fair. It is a question mark. GMOs have been around less than 30 years, so I can't... No one can tell you what's going to happen in 100 years, but likely nothing. However, impacts to the environment do exist from the GMOs that have something to do with pesticides, whether it's they make their own, whether it's they can resist them. We're going to see impacts because of that. The United States, things are changing, and you might start seeing labels on your food here soon.